surmount one study design. There were 2,539 participants in the trial. There were four arms, uh, randomized one to one to one to one. Um, and randomization was stratified by country, sex, and prediabetes, yes, no. Um, the study duration uh, depended on whether a person had uh, prediabetes or not. So people who did not have prediabetes were in the trial for 72 weeks, and that's the data that we presented today. The individuals who have prediabetes uh, will continue on for a two-year treatment period um, to look at their outcomes. Um, there was also an upper uh, limit enrollment of women of 70%, and that's because historically obesity trials include more men than women, and so there was an effort to make sure that men were included in the trial as well. Um, so during the first 72-week period, only uh, one uh, 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 drug uh, dose reduction per participant was permitted uh, to help manage intolerable, uh, any intolerable gastrointestinal side effects. So the primary objectives were to demonstrate that trisepatide 10 milligrams or 15 milligrams was superior to placebo at 72 weeks. This included percent change in body weight and percentage of participants with greater than or equal to 5% body weight reduction. The key secondary objectives uh, included looking at weight reduction targets that we have, and these included greater than or equal to 10%, 15%, and 20%. And additionally, the, there was a uh, key secondary objective for the five milligram dose, and that was to look at percent change in body weight and percent of participants with greater than or equal to 5% body weight reduction. Um, and then finally, in terms of key secondary objectives, um, there were objectives looking at cardiometabolic risk factors, including triglycerides, cholesterol, systolic blood pressure, uh, fasting insulin, and then waist circumference. So in terms of baseline demographics, the uh, average age was 44.9 years, so almost 45 years old. Um, uh, in terms of women, there was 67.5% uh, who were uh, female in the study. Um, in terms of race, it was 70% white, um, and uh, Black or Af African American was 7.9. Um, in terms of eth ethnicity, 47.8% were Hispanic or Latino. For baseline characteristics of the participants, the baseline uh, body weight was uh, 104 uh, kilograms. The BMI was 38. In terms of prediabetes, you can see that uh, just over 40% of the, of the uh, participants uh, had prediabetes. Prediabetes was defined by the ADA criteria and participants did have OGTTs. Um, and then uh, uh, systolic blood pressure was 123, diastolic um, 79, um, and no, uh, uh, and kidney function was normal. So now in terms of the results, um, uh, just to orient you, weight change from baseline in percent is on the y-axis and time from randomization in weeks is on the x-axis. And the color coding scheme that I will use is gray for placebo, light blue for trisapatide five, um, uh, then uh, uh, the middle blue is 10 milligrams and then the navy blue is 15. Um, on treatment or efficacy estimate is in red and in trial or treatment regimen estimate is in purple. So in terms of the results, first we'll look at on treatment. Um, so on treatment, uh, there was a 2.4% reduction in the placebo group. Um, and then for the trisepatide groups, it was 16, 21.4, 22.5 for the various trisepatide groups respectively. The placebo subtracted difference uh, for the 15 milligram dose of trisepatide was 20.1%. And then in trial, the placebo group uh, percent body weight reduction was 3.1. Um, and then on the trisepatide doses, 15, 19.5, and 20.9 respectively. With the placebo subtracted dose uh, for, from the uh, 15 milligrams of trisepatide was 17.8%. A couple of things to note on this figure. So first, uh, please note that there was an early treatment response um, even at four weeks in terms of individuals in the trisepatide groups uh, starting to lose weight, um, and that the 10 and 15 milligram doses resulted in relatively similar weight reduction. In terms of absolute weight change, so this is what our patients often ask us, how much weight uh, could I possibly lose with this medicine? Again, the baseline weight was 231 pounds, 
And in terms of the absolute weight change for placebo, it was uh, 5.3 pounds. And for the trisepatide doses, it was 35.5, 48.9, and 52 pounds, resulting in an average weight reduction of 35 to 52 pounds. And again, this is average. So some participants lost uh, more weight and some participants lost less weight. And I did include more information on that in the presentation this morning. In terms of the percent of part participants reaching weight reduction targets, um, so uh, there's a lot of data that's going to be shown here, but again, to orient you on the y-axis are the participants in terms of the percent who reached these weight reduction targets that are clinically meaningful, and then on the, um, uh, on the x-axis is the body weight reduction target percent that we're looking at. So 5% has long been um, used as the standard, uh, losing greater than or equal to 5% does result in um, meaning, clinically meaningful metabolic uh, improvements in metabolic health. And then included also are the higher targets for weight reduction, which contribute to uh, greater improvement in overall health. And as you can see, uh, there was a very uh, good response in terms of even these higher weight reduction targets. And for simplicity, I'm focusing on the 15 milligram dose. Um, so on the 15 milligram dose, more than 90% of participants achieved the greater than or equal to 5% uh, uh, weight reduction target. Uh, so that's nine out of 10 individuals. And on treatment, it was 96%. Um, half or a majority of um, participants achieved the greater than or equal to 20% body weight reduction target. Uh, and on treatment, it was actually 63% of participants who reached this target. Um, and then finally, for the exploratory greater than or equal to 25% weight reduction target, um, more than a third of participants reached this target. And on treatment, it was actually almost 40% of individuals who lost a quarter of their body weight. So to put this into perspective, um, if somebody did achieve this kind of weight um, reduction, uh, if they weighed 200 pounds and lost uh, greater than or equal to 25% of their body weight, they would have lost down to 150 pounds. In terms of um, some uh, outcomes, so ch uh, change in A1C, so 40% of the participants did have prediabetes, but the baseline A1C was 5.6, which is within normal range. Um, and there was a decrease in A1C by half a percent that was observed. And additionally, of the participants who had prediabetes, more than 95% reverted to normal glycemia in the trisepatide groups. In terms of lipids, uh, again, for the participants, they were within normal range at baseline. Um, uh, nonetheless, we saw improvements in lipids across the board, um, and notably for triglycerides, there was a greater than 27% decrease. Um, so consistent improvements in all lipid levels. In terms of change in blood pressure over time, a systolic blood pressure was 123 at baseline, and you can see that it decreased throughout the study, especially um, during that dose escalation period up to 24 weeks, then plateauing out with a decrease of eight millimeters um, overall throughout the study. And in terms of diastolic blood pressure, um, also a uh, significant reduction. So again, normal at baseline um, from uh, 79 and then uh, uh, decreasing by five millimeters down to uh, 74 for the diastolic blood pressure. So improvements in blood pressure um, does not appear to be dependent on the high magnitude of weight reduction. So in terms of the adverse events, uh, there were similar percentages of participants in the trisepatide and placebo groups who reported serious adverse events, and there, were no, um, there was no increase in incidence of death on trisepatide as compared to placebo. I'll also just mention, I don't think I have a slide on this, but this trial occurred in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. It started in December, 2019. So just to put that into context in terms of the number of participants who were retained and, and, and uh, completed the trial on treatment and also in terms of uh, you know, adverse events, I think it's really important to note that it's an amazing feat. In terms of the treatment emergent adverse events that were greater than or equal to 5%, uh, the, the most common were gastrointestinal um, and uh, uh, mild to moderate in nature, mostly occurring during dose escalation. The top three were nausea, diarrhea, and constipation. Um, please note that vomiting was actually the fifth, uh, so it was not even in the top three, which is, which is uh, you know, different than, than potentially what we've seen in the past, so this was also important to note. 
Um, in terms of um, uh, the primary reason for discontinuation of the study, it was the gastrointestinal adverse events. That was the primary reason, but they, it was not very frequent. Um, so basically few people discontinued from the study. Um, and um, so that's important to note. In terms of adverse events of special interest that we focus on um, with such agents, um, so there were uh, serious um, uh, gastrointestinal events, but they were, um, uh, you know, evenly spread. Um, they occurred slightly more in the trizepatide groups, but overall, um, uh, there were not many overall. In terms of pancreatitis, there were four reported cases of adjudicated uh, confirmed pancreatitis, and they were evenly distributed across the treatment groups, including placebo. So there was one, 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 and one. Um, and in terms of gallbladder disease, again, as would be expected, um, these events did occur. But if you but notice that in placebo, there were also five. In the trisepatide five, there were five. And then 10, 11, what, there were 11. And then in trisepatide 15, there were six. Um, there was increased acute cholecystitis in the trisepatide groups. And again, this has been observed in studies of bariatric surgery um, and uh, studies where people lose a substantial, significant amount of weight. So key takeaways are all trisepatide doses demonstrated superior, clinically meaningful, and sustained body weight reductions versus placebo in participants with obesity, and this was true for both estimand analyses. Uh, participants experienced average weight reduction of 19.5, 20.9 with um, trisepatide 10 and 15 milligrams respectively, and that was for treatment regimen estimand, the more conservative estimand. And treatment with trisepatide at all doses translated to clin clinically meaningful improvements in cardiometabolic risk factors, and the tolerability and safety profile of trisepatide is consistent with GLP-1 receptor agonist class in people with obesity. Thank you, and I would be very happy to take all of your questions. Hey, Anya, thank you very much. So we are open to questions, and some of those will come through virtual means and some from you here in the audience. Any? from the room. Go ahead, please stand up, introduce yourself, please. Mitchell Zola from Medscape. <clears throat> so uh, during the session this morning, I think uh, both uh, Dr. Romy and Dr. Kaplan made reference to the fact that you see here we're saying that uh, the effects you see here with trisepatide are uh, clearly better than we're seeing with semaglutide. And I'm wondering, um, on an evidence-based way, is that actually um, something that's been demonstrated? I say that because in the uh, surpass trial that was head-to-head uh, -head against semaglutide, it used a lower dose than is now available for weight loss. And um, there um, doesn't seem to be any other, as far as I know, head-to-head -head comparison of semaglutide to the weight loss, the Wagovi dosage. So how clear is it that the uh, treatment effect is clearly better with uh, terzepatide. Great. Um, thank you. And, and Mitchell, is that right? Mitchell, Mitchell from Medscape. Thank you so much for your question. Great question. So the head-to-head -head trial um, looking at the, the doses was for the diabetes doses. So that's why the semaglutide dose in that trial that you're referring to is lower. Right now, there are no head-to-head -head trials of, um, you know, the obesity doses, so semaglutide 2.4 and trisepatide 5, 10, 15. It's an absolutely great question um, and one that we need answered, but you're absolutely right. Um, direct comparison cannot me be made because these are different trials with different participants. Um, and so, again, I mean, these are assumptions, um, but again, um, it's important to note that we need to do those studies. Great question. Okay. Um, so, Dr. Eckel, could you comment on that? Do you think that there is any legitimacy right now to the proposition that terzepatide is better for weight loss than semaglutide, or is that still something to be proven? Well, that's a hypothesis yet to be tested. You should come to the obesity symposium at the Hilton Riverside tonight. We're going to be discussing these kinds of issues. So thank you for your questions. A very good one. And, but and I'll just follow up real quick, um, Mitchell. So basically, if you look at the percent of individuals who reach the weight reduction targets, more individuals with trisepatide did reach those weight reduction targets. 
And then, you know, the exploratory weight reduction target of greater than or equal to 25%, that, that's something, I mean, it was exploratory because, you know, I mean, you, you can't plan for something that you don't know the results are going to be, you know, the, the way they were that good. Um, so, so it's just important to note that. And again, it is different trials. We cannot make direct comparisons, but we have not seen this with any other agent in phase three trials. Um, as was alluded to by Dr. Um, uh, Roney and Dr. Kaplan, um, there is earlier data, for example, with uh, CAGRI-SEMA, the combination of cagrilantide with semaglutide. Um, there was a phase 1b trial that was published. So, you know, the point of this, I think, is not that one thing is better than another. Um, not that one thing or one agent is going to solve obesity. It's all the different medications, the different surgeries, the different therapies that we have for obesity, all working together. And it depends what's right for which patient. Um, so I think we have to keep it in that context. And again, not everybody will respond to semaglutide. Not everybody will respond to terzepatide. Not everybody will respond to Cagrisema. Um, and you know, as I showed you with the waterfall plots this morning, most people did respond to terzepatide, but there were individuals who did not. So another thing to keep in, in, in context that's critical is there's not one type of obesity. So we shouldn't be surprised that everybody doesn't respond to one type of therapy. We have different types of obesity. We're just not far enough along yet to be able to identify. We don't have biomarkers to identify who will respond to a kind of treatment um, and what kind of obesity a person may have. So, but, you know, excellent question. Thank you. Okay, we have a question from the front row. Please identify yourself. Hi, Regina Schaefer from Helio and Endocrine Today. Good to see both of you again. Um, <laughs> so kind of dovetailing off what you just, you started to address my question, which is um, there's heterogeneity in response. Some participants did, you know, barely lost 5%. Can you tell us a little bit about those participants? Is there anything that stands out about them and what clinicians should consider in terms of who might be the best candidate for this drug potentially? Yeah, great question and very nice to see you in person. Um, so in terms of the, the the individuals who didn't respond or maybe responded less, excellent question. Um, again, these are you know uh, results that we have right now, but there are sub-analyses that are ongoing. Um, just like, for example, differentiating who may uh, benefit more from 10 versus 15, uh, same thing with the five. And one thing that we did not have time to highlight in the symposium this morning is that the response to the five milligram dose is pretty remarkable in and of itself. Um, and, and again, it was included as a key secondary because, you know, based on the phase two trial that was done in patients who have type two diabetes, you know, they couldn't, they couldn't predict that in individuals with obesity, the response would be to the degree that it was. Um, so I think your question is great. We need to know, you know, which doses and which medicines work best for which patients. Um, right now, it's the important thing is to work closely with our patients to see what they are responding to. And if they're not responding to something, to offer them a different therapy um, and to, to basically ensure that we're, we're helping them to get to their weight and health goals with whatever treatment works for them. I think the important point you're making is that five milligrams is also successful. Can you comment just briefly on whether the adverse effects, the GI adverse effects for the titration schedule was any different at the three doses? Yeah, so great question too. The titration schedule was not different. Um, it's, you know, it's interesting because if you look at the adverse events or the side effects in uh, the 10 and the 15, uh, there's not more in the 15. And so it's, it's really a really interesting phenomenon. And I think what we need to do as clinicians is we need to listen to our patients mm -hmm. and hear them. And, you know, for example, if they say, you know, I started this medicine and I, I'm feeling a little bit nauseated or I'm having some diarrhea, we need to say, okay, well, how about we back off on the dose a little bit? Let's go back down to the, to the first lower dose and let's see, and let's just keep you on it for a little bit longer. Let your body get used to it. And the key about that is because again, the, the, um, the, the slide that my colleague, Dr. Machinani showed was that a majority of those GI side effects were in the beginning. They were during dose escalation. And so as clinicians, we can work with our patients and basically escalate those doses more slowly for any of these types of medications. We don't have to increase once a month. And, and other additional tools that are helpful besides, um, you know, a slower um, uh, up titration of the dose, 
um, is listening to our patients in terms of, okay, well, you had these side effects. Do you remember what you ate that day? Do you remember what you ate the day before? And ide identifying potentially foods that may have triggered that. So for example, if they ate egg salad and then they had diarrhea, maybe it was the fatty food. And then the other thing is that as I, as I start patients on these medications, so you know, right now we have semaglutide available. Um, as I start patients on these medications, I basically say to them, okay, so if you respond to this medicine, you're going to notice that you feel full earlier that you cannot eat as much as you used to eat, but you don't want to eat more. You don't want to go back for seconds. And so remember that you may be eating smaller amounts at mealtimes, but potentially be eating more frequently or just eating smaller amounts at mealtimes. And that's okay. And the social pressure to eat is immense. When we go out to dinner with friends or when we're eating a family style dinner with our family, there is this pressure to eat. And so again, we just have to reframe this and, and really openly talk about it with our patients so that they can share with us what their experiences, what their journey is as we help them treat their obesity. Welcome to New Orleans, right? <laughs> Question from the virtual audience, please. Question to both of you. Uh, do you see this as a game changer? So I have had this question several times now. Um, I think, again, it's important to note that this is a new era for obesity treatment. So um, Dr. Uh, Kaplan said this in his talk. So there were first-generation medicines, second-generation, which were about uh, 2010 to, uh, to, to, say, 2015 or 19, let's say, 2020. Starting last year with semaglutide and now with trizepatide, this is a new era for obesity treatment. So those medications are much more highly effective than any medications that we've had for the treatment of obesity right now. They are clearly exceeding the greater than or equal to 5% uh, weight reduction target. And so we, what we really need to focus on is this is a new era for our patients. This is a new era for physicians caring for patients with obesity, which is all of us. Um, and basically, we now have the tools and we'll have more tools going forward to be able to treat our patients with obesity. Now, keep in mind, one of the comparators that's needed is the approach to patients surgically. And metabolic surgery really has outcomes that are very favorable. So the type of comparator study that's really needed is a randomized controlled trial with semaglutide or trisepatide versus metabolic surgery. So that's very desperately needed now to make patients make the best choice for themselves individually. Go ahead. Uh, one other question we have, uh, what does this mean for weight loss research going forward? Weight loss research. <laughs> um, so, and Dr. Aroni did include some of these, these points. I think, you know, just as Dr. LaRue said that obesity is a disease, what we haven't done with obesity until recently is really focus on understanding the pathophysiology in a way that we can design treatments that target that pathophysiology. So I alluded to the fact in the Q&A, or I mentioned it, that our um, body, specifically our brain, sets a body fat mass set point. And why does it do this? It does this because our bodies and brains are super smart. What is the goal of the body fat mass set point? The goal is to not let us starve. That's how we evolved. And then superimposed on this beautiful system that does not let us starve because we don't want to die. It doesn't let us starve. We have the obesogenic environment with these highly palatable, ubiquitous foods that are inexpensive um, and, and basically available all the time. We have high stress lives. We have sedentary lives. Um, and all of these things contribute to the obesogenic environment. And basically our system's like, well, let's hold on to this fat. Let's hold on to this extra weight so that in case there's a famine, we will not starve. But in that obesogenic environment, what happens is our body fat mass set point keeps on getting pushed up and so we carry extra weight, and then that extra adiposity, that extra fat, causes detrimental effects on our health. And so I think that is a really key point in terms of where should obesity research be going? 
we should be developing, just like I think trisepatide and semaglutide, targeted therapies, therapies that target the mechanisms the neurometabolic mechanisms of obesity. I think that is where we need to be headed with obesity research. Okay, thank you, Anya. Apparently there are no further questions from the virtual audience. Are there more questions here in front row, please? And then I'll get you in the back, okay? Front row, please identify yourself. We need a mic. Great Hi, my name's Lisa Nangola, and I normally work for Medscape, but I'm now tasked with writing this for our WebMD audience. So I wonder if you could both just summarize in layman's terms, what are the most important findings from this study? What does this mean for patients? Obviously, the drug isn't available for obesity here yet, but it is for diabetes. Do you see doctors prescribing it off-label and comment on perhaps the differences in doses for those Two. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for your questions, Lisa. So I'll try and I might have to ask you to reiterate some of them. Um, so in terms of the most important findings from the study, um, I think notably about nine out of 10 individuals in the study had weight reduction, nine out of 10 lost weight. We have not seen that previously in phase three uh, study. So I think that is highly notable. And then additionally, um, uh, you know, again, this average weight loss for the highest dose um, uh, on treatment of 22.5% um, is also something we've never seen. Um, I think the exploratory aim of the greater than or equal to 25% weight reduction target that, you know, in the on treatment group, um, you know, nearly 40% of people lost that much weight, uh, <laughs> lost a quarter of their body weight. Again, something we've not seen. And so I think those are some key important take homes. And then the fact that even though at baseline, these uh, individuals were were relatively uh, metabolically healthy, although again, one might argue because, because they do have the disease of obesity and 40% did have prediabetes, which I think is very important. Um, all of those parameters that we assessed improved. So I think those are some key take homes. In terms of your, your, your questions, so... Um, Trisepatide, as you said, has been FDA approved for, for the treatment of type 2 diabetes um, and will likely be commercially available later this month. Um, I cannot comment on off-label use um, and 5, 10, and 15. Yeah, 5, 10, and 15. And those are the SURPASS trials that uh, Juan, Dr. Frias, talked about in, in the first uh, session this morning. Um, so, yeah, and I, I mean, I cannot comment in terms of, you know, off-label use. Repeat the question. So, so, so yeah. So, so the question is: Is it a different dose for semaglutide? Yeah. So, semaglutide, the the obesity treatment dose that is FDA approved is two point four, um, and and it go, it starts from an escalation of uh, 0 0.25, 0 0.5, 1, 1 1.7, and then two point four. But please note, the, you know, these agents are very different. So, semaglutide is a GLP one receptor agonist, and trisepatide is GIP. GLP-1 receptor agonists. So they are different. Um, they are both in the class of nutrient hormone, nutrient stimulated hormone therapies, nutrient stimulated hormone therapies. So the reason why I say that is because these hormones, as well as, for example, uh, amylin cagrillantide, right, that we mentioned before, um, they're all hormones that respond when we eat. So they are nutrient stimulated. So we eat, and then these hormones uh, respond, they get secreted, they increase. Um, and this is important because hormones signal the brain or our, our satiety. Hormones signal the brain our homeostatic uh, place, so our body fat mass set point. So what happens is basically um, when, when we gain weight or lose weight, what happens is these hormones signal to our brain, hey, you just lost fat mass. Hey, you just uh, gained fat mass. Now what? increase thermogenesis, decrease appetite, or vice versa. So that's why th this is important. And, and that's why I think also it's really exciting that again, we're starting to target these mechanisms. We're giving people what they are making physiologically. We're just giving it in medications to, to potentially impact obesity. Yeah. All right, thank you. In the back of the room, please identify yourself and please ask your question. And I think we have another one from the outside audience too. Good. 
Uh, hi, my name is uh, Ashwin. I'm from Close Concerns. Um, and so you mentioned the primary reason for discontinuation was uh, GI events. Uh, I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on when those events occurred. Did it primarily occur during up titration when the events were most common, or did they occur in people who had persistent events after titration? Yeah, great question. Um, and it's really important to clarify that. So yes, most of those gastrointestinal side effects occurred during dose escalation. And the, you know, this is what we've seen clinically with semaglutide and other GLP-1 receptor agonists. And again, trisepatide is, is, is a totally different molecule, but, but uh, similarly, basically what happened with this is that those events happened mainly during dose escalation and then uh, decreased over time. Welcome to GLP-1 receptor agonist. <laughs> so, so again, I mean, and this is key because our patients, like if they have those side effects initially, we need to work with them. We need to see, you know, do we need to down titrate? Do we need to talk about, you know, whether they're, they're having that social pressure to eat and whether they're eating past the point of fullness? Because if you continue to eat the way that, you know, we normally eat, which all of us do this, right? Basically what happens is that you feel like you just ate you know, two Thanksgiving dinners or three Thanksgiving dinners. And you're like, oh my gosh, I'm so full, right? So these medicines help you in, in various different ways. But one of the ways that they help us is we feel full earlier. Um, and, and also important to note is once you reach a new weight plateau, your hunger and everything comes back, but your weight does not because you are at a new fat body fat mass set point. So you, 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 you would feel as if, you know, when, when, before you lost the weight, but you don't gain back the weight. And that's critical because that appetite loss that, you know, that was, that was reported initially, that could be very concerning to people, right? They're like, oh, I don't have any appetite. Like this, this isn't good, right? I, I want my appetite. That appetite returns once they reach their weight plateau. Their appetite will return, but the weight does not. Great question. All right, another question from our remote audience. So we have a question here from Everyday Health that you may have in pieces already answered, but um, she wants to know how does the drug work? Okay, that, that's a great question. And we did spend some time during the symposium talking about that. The exact mechanisms are not known. We do um, uh, know that GIP has multiple sites of action. So beyond the pancreas, uh, so in the fat cells, in the brain. And so again, we, what we think is that it signals to our brain, you know, whether it's fullness or other things are where we are homeostatically. Um, so th that's how we, and again, it targets both GIP and GLP-1, um, but those mechanisms do need to be worked out. And again, the important thing is, you know, right now we know that it's working, we're, we're working out on those physiology studies to understand better. You know, we're living in an era of health equity. And one of the issues is access to these medications, whether it be high-dose semaglutide, high-dose liraglutide, or now lorazepam. Uh, with lorazepam, can you ultimately think out loud about whether this drug is going to be available for all patients who need it once approved? Um, so in terms of, I mean, and again, this question comes up and, and Dr. Kaplan uh, answered it in the, in the main session as well. Um, and, and, you know, and his answer included, you know, that the answer is, is not to wait till all of these medications are potentially generic. Um, I think that as healthcare providers, we do whatever we can. So last uh, spring, I testified in our uh, state Senate supporting all treatments for patients with obesity. So bariatric surgery, as well as anti-obesity medications, basically um, asking our, uh, you know, our senators to approve, uh, to basically say that, um, that these medications and the, the bariatric surgery procedures should be covered uh, in terms of insurance, in terms of private insurers, as well as Medicaid. Um, so I think we need to continue to do that work um, because, you know, as you're saying, Bob, basically, you know, there, there are these health disparities and often the people who don't necessarily have uh, the types of insurance that cover these medications are actually the ones that we need to help yes. the most. Uh, so I think all of us need to continue doing that work. Um, yeah. I think that's the best answer possible right okay, now. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions from the audience? Yes, a couple from the front row, both from Medscape. <laughs> and WebMD, Lisa from WebMD. It's Web me MD. trying to pivot my scientific brain to um, a lay audience. So you're talking about the weight plateau. Once you reach it, you don't regain the weight. But does that mean you have to keep taking this for life? 
or can you stop the drug? And I mean, I don't know if you can speak. I know with bariatric surgery, people do often regain weight as well. So can you yeah. compare yeah. the two perhaps? Sure. Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, so, so in terms of continuing of the medication, so um, again, if we, we have to, so if we think of obesity, obesity is a chronic disease. So in some ways, if we think about that, well, why would we treat a chronic disease only for a few months, right? Uh, or 72 weeks have, have, you know, have you. And so again, let's put it in the context of if you, uh, if we ask ourselves that question about obesity, can we ask ourselves that same question about any other disease? So let's take hypertension for, as an example. If a patient has hypertension and we start that patient on an antihypertensive medication and their blood pressure improves, would we stop that medicine? We would never ask ourselves that question. Of course we'd continue the medicine because if we stop that antihypertensive, their blood pressure will go back up. In parallel, the same question can be asked for obesity. If a patient has obesity and we start them on an anti-obesity medication and they respond and their fat mass set point decreases, what would happen if we stopped that anti-obesity medication? Their body fat mass set point would increase right back up. They would gain back the weight. So again, this underscores the fact that obesity is a chronic disease and therefore it necessitates uh, you know, long-term continued treatment. In terms of uh, the question about bariatric surgery, um, you know, there have been long-term outcome studies looking at this now, um, and a majority of the weight uh, reduction is retained. So patients can regain weight, and, and if that weight regain occurs, um, it's somewhere around uh, 12 to 18 months, usually around 18 is when patients come to see me. Uh, they've had surgery, and they'd like to start on an anti-obesity medication to potentially stop the weight regain or potentially lose more of the weight. Um, uh, that they perhaps didn't didn't uh, reach with the bariatric surgery because they started at a higher BMI, um, you know. But looking out farther down the road, yes, patients can regain you know twenty five percent of the weight they lost. But if you lost a hundred pounds and ten years later you've retained seventy five pounds of that of that weight loss, I think that's a success. And the other thing I would have to say is it's not just weight regain; it's also the fact that there's disease progression. So if we have a patient with type 2 diabetes and we start them on metformin, do we think that the only medicine they'll ever need is metformin? We make the assumption that over time, insulin resistance gets worse and we'll have to add agents. And in the same way with obesity, it's not necessarily weight regain. What it might be is disease progression. And basically they continue on that uh, weight gain trajectory. Okay, we're gonna take one final question from the front. And then if you have additional questions come up after the... Uh the press conference. Go ahead, please. Um, so the point was already raised a few minutes ago that um, this study was done um, in people selected not to have diabetes, but the uh, terzepatide is currently on the U.S. market approved a few weeks ago for treating patients with type 2 diabetes. So I'm wondering, um, are there any um, lessons, any messages from uh, Surmount 1 that could be used to inform the use of terzepatide in patients with type 2 diabetes? And a somewhat related question is, uh, now that terzepatide is an option for type 2 diabetes, how would you briefly characterize its role relative to the many other options that are out there for type 2 diabetes? Great questions, Thank Mitchell. Um, so to answer your first question, and I really appreciate that question, Mitchell, because um, because, and this is actually critical for, for uh, healthcare providers who take care of patients with diabetes, um, there's not a head-to-head -head trial looking at this, but if you look at the weight reduction in people who have diabetes, whether it's with trisepatide, semaglutide, other uh, agents, the weight reduction in people with diabetes is, is lower than in people who don't yet have diabetes. So people in the, so individuals in the trials uh, like surmount one who did not have diabetes, they lost more weight. And so I think you bring up a key point because let's say we're treating people with diabetes and we say, oh, well, but this person didn't lose as much weight as we saw in surmount one. Well, we should not be surprised because again, there's something different about patients once they've already developed type two diabetes where they lose less weight with these agents. Now it's key. I think this is incredibly key because what does that what message does that send? It sends the message that we are treating patients too late. 
we should be treating patients when they have obesity before they develop type 2 diabetes. We can help their health more. And so I think we should be treating patients earlier. And, you know, the, the first question from the audience this morning was specifically about adolescents, and there aren't um, studies yet with trisepatide in adolescents, but, but there are in terms of type 2 diabetes, so adolescents with type 2 diabetes. So the question arises, when in the lifespan do we start treating, um, and are there ways to, to prevent type 2 diabetes by treating obesity head on? And so I think it's a, it's a really, really important question that you ask. So, Andrew, just a clarification, there were no patients with type 2 diabetes in this study. They there were had, no patients. They all had yes. pre-diabetes, the, the but 40, it su yes. suggests maybe the existence of an insulin resistance state has something to do with the pharmacological effect of this GLP-1 receptor agonist com combination yeah. agonist. And 40% and did have pre-diabetes, but as yeah. you said, Bob, nobody had type 2 diabetes. Right. And I think that's why it's also so interesting that there is going to be this two-year, um, you know, the, the trial is going to go on for two more years for the 40% of participants who had prediabetes and we'll be able to see, was their weight reduction different? And we don't know the answer to that question. So I, I really like the way that that was designed because I think it's answering a key question that we don't know the answer to yet. All right. Well, oh. Um, so for those data and OGTT data and everything, those will be presented at subsequent meetings. Yeah, rep um, repeat and, the question, please. Oh, I'm sorry. So the question was the average A1C for the individuals with prediabetes. And my answer, yeah, yeah. So again, those data and those results are going to be presented at subsequent meetings, and there will be more um, analyses based on the, the the work that we presented today. Um, the the work that we did present today is um, is you know is already published in New England as of a couple hours ago. Just a final comment: exciting study that's going to impact medical care for patients with type two diabetes. Not this study, but also obesity. But back to Mitchell's question: I think ultimately, if the fifteen milligram dose is approved for type two diabetes. Why wouldn't we expect weight reduction, albeit maybe a little bit less? <laughs> so ultimately, the application there can go off label. But for treating type two diabetes, we want rate weight reduction, don't we? <laughs> so this is going to be beneficial for those patients too. So I'm going to close the formal aspects of this press conference. Can I make one? I'm going to close it with one comment okay. because I, this did not come up, and I think it's critical. So when patients come to see me in clinic, at that point. They have faced so much stigma. They have so much self-blame. They have struggled. And one of the first things that I do is I invite my patients to share their weight journey with yeah. me. I ask them to share their successes. I ask them to share their struggles. And at that point, I hone in and I say, this is not your fault. This is biology. Your body is smart. It does not want you to starve. Two thirds of Americans have overweight or obesity. By 2030, 50% will have a BMI of greater than 30. This is not our patient's choice. Obesity is not a lifestyle choice. It is biology and it is our job to help our patients to treat their disease of obesity. All right, thank you. Thank you all for your participation. Come on up afterwards if you have additional questions. I'm going to close the thank press you. conference now. Thank you.